Welcome back to this afternoon's session. Um, I'm Eric Winsberg. I teach philosophy at the University of South Florida, uh, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you someone who I think among this group needs very little introduction, uh, Shelley Tremaine. She is, um, I think, one of the two best uh, interpreters of Foucault that I know, who is, I think, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century, and uh, I think uh, is an especially important philosopher uh, this year. Um, uh, she is the author of uh, uh, Foucault and Feminist Philosophy of Disability uh, and the editor of Foucault and the Government of Disability. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn over the uh, podium, as it were, to Shelley. Thank you for the kind introduction, Eric. I'd like to say that I've enjoyed all of the talks um, and the discussion today. It's been fabulous. So thank you, everyone. This presentation extends my investigations into the ways in which disability is naturalized in philosophy. That is, expands my analyses of how an individualized and medicalized conception of disability according to which disability is a naturally disadvantageous characteristic or property of individuals, is naturalized in, for example, bioethics, ethics and political philosophy, philosophy of mind and feminist philosophy. By the end of the presentation, I will have indicated how this conception of disability informs the notable indifference of philosophers the predictable COVID-19 tragedy unfolding in nursing homes and other institutions in which seniors and younger disabled people are placed. And in addition, I will have argued that philosophers must engage in conceptual engineering with respect to how disability in these institutions are understood and represented. Throughout the presentation, I will refer to these institutional settings in various ways, primarily using the unfashionable term nursing home rather than the more upbeat phrase long-term care facility. For I contend that the latter phrase is a misnomer, a euphemism designed to conceal the archaic and barbaric character of these institutions. The recuperation of the former term, that is, nursing home, is thus intended to make explicit that these institutions are outdated and should be rendered obsolete. Indeed, as I will show furthermore, these places are neither a home nor a site of care. Philosophers generally do not regard critical examination of disability as pertinent to research and teaching in social metaphysics and social epistemology, nor do they, generally speaking, appreciate the critical importance of philosophy of disability, but rather remain resolute that philosophical inquiry about disability is appropriately and adequately conducted in the subfield of bioethics a contestable subfield that both rationalizes and legitimizes eugenic practices. In my philosophical writing and activism in the profession, I have endeavored to show how the naturalizing and individualizing assumptions upon which these practices of confirmation bias rely are inextricably entwined with the conceptual analytical inquiries that philosophers pursue and the judgments that they make about faculty searches and hiring practices, journal submissions, curricula, conference lineups, and tenure and promotion. In other words, social metaphysics and social epistemology of impairment and disability must consider how claims that naturalize these ostensibly biological phenomena emerge, in what context these claims are mobilized and advanced, and for what social, economic, institutional, professional, and political purposes. In this presentation, therefore, I do the following. I scrutinize claims made about COVID-19 outbreaks in nursing homes, group homes, psychiatric hospitals, 
and other institutions in which disabled people and seniors are segregated. I point out that disability is naturalized and depoliticized in care discourses about how these institutions are situated with respect to the pandemic. And I argue that philosophers must engage in radical conceptual engineering that construes disability as an apparatus of power, one of whose mechanisms is the nursing home industrial complex, as I refer to it. An aim of the presentation is to convince you that ontology is always already political. That is, I aim to convince you that ontology and politics are mutually constitutive, mutually reinforcing. My presentation thus implicitly advances an argument for the erosion of the artifactual distinctions between theoretical philosophy and applied philosophy, ideal theory, non-ideal theory. Naturalization of an individualized and medicalized conception of disability in discourses about nursing homes is a form of structural gaslighting. Nora Berenstain has remarked that philosophers partake in structural gaslighting when they invoke epistemologies and ideologies of domination to actively and routinely disappear and obscure actual causes, mechanisms, and effects of oppression. My argument is that the epistemologies and ontologies of domination within philosophy have persistently naturalized disability, repeatedly sabotage attempts to improve the situation and status of disabled philosophers, in part because these epistemologies and ontologies facilitate reconstitution within both the discipline and profession of deeply entrenched prejudices according to which disabled people are defective, unreliable, and suboptimal. Against the individualized and medicalized conception of disability that prevails in philosophy, I maintain that disability is an apparatus of power in Michel Foucault's sense. Structural gaslighting about nursing homes, which the individualized and medicalized conception of disability bolsters, is one strategy of this apparatus of disability. The exclusion of disabled people from the profession of philosophy and other positions of epistemic authority is another strategy of this apparatus. As Foucault explained it, an apparatus is an ensemble of, among other things, discourses, institutions, scientific statements, laws, administrative measures, and philosophical propositions mobilized in response to a perceived social need in a particular historical moment. The perceived social requirement to which the historically contextually specific apparatus of disability response is biopolitical normalization. Philosophers have largely ignored the social, economic, and political circumstances that surround nursing homes and other congregate settings in which seniors, elders, and younger disabled people are put. Preferring to understand these settings as politically neutral sites of care, love, and benevolence, other than understand and represent them as carceral environments that enable the segregation and management of certain populations deemed to be disposable. According to a New York Times report, 479,000 residents and staff of 19,000 nursing homes in the United States were infected with COVID-19 by mid-September, while more than 77,000 residents and staff of these institutions had by mid-September died of the virus. Residents and staff of nursing homes located in predominantly Black neighborhoods of U.S. cities were disproportionately represented among these fatalities. By October 27th, 84,136 COVID-19 deaths had occurred in nursing homes in the United States 
and 537,446 COVID-19 cases were recorded in these institutions. Figures that do not account for the COVID-19 deaths and cases in group homes, psychiatric hospitals, and other institutions where seniors and disabled people in the United States live. Nevertheless, philosophers have had little to say about these COVID-19 deaths and cases and the conditions that precipitated them. Indeed, philosophers, including feminist philosophers, seem to take for granted that the bulk of these institutional cases and deaths are attributable to a natural property or characteristic inherent to senior and disabled populations. Hence, these cases and deaths philosophers seem to imply are in some sense unavoidable, and thus are neither ethically nor politically troubling. Not even philosophers who advance proposals about how society should respond to COVID-19 have interrogated the relationship between the outbreaks in these institutions and the character of the institutions themselves. This refusal on the part of philosophers to closely examine the social, economic, and political circumstances in which these COVID-19 cases and deaths have occurred has enabled the ageist, ableist, classist, and racist conditions that contributed to the causes of these infections and fatalities to remain obscured and unchallenged, including the ableist neoliberal socioeconomic conditions that made possible the very existence of the institutions. Hence, I call upon philosophers to pursue a form of conceptual engineering with respect to nursing homes. That is to acknowledge that nursing homes, so-called long-term care facilities, group homes and other institutions in which seniors, elders and younger disabled people are confined, constitute the fulcrum of a massive network of governmentality that I have named nursing home industrial complex. This revision of our perceptions and understandings of nursing homes and their functions could be described as a process of semantic amelioration. Semantic amelioration, as Sally Hasslanger defines it, involves the expansion and improvement of the resources available to us with which to understand phenomena. To illustrate this definition, Hasslanger points to the movement from an understanding of the concept of race as a biological kind to an understanding of the concept of race as a socio-historical kind. Hasslinger notes that the distinct conceptual schemas available in the respective historical milieus in which these disparate understandings of the metaphysical status of race circulated have generated divergent understandings of the concept of race. With my own terms of reference, I want to argue that the conceptual schema which currently generates perceptions and understandings of nursing homes and other congregate settings in which seniors and disabled people are put is a historically contingent mechanism of the apparatus of disability. That is the conceptual schema that construes these institutions as paradigmatic sites of care and love, rather than as the linchpin of an industrial complex of governmentality, is an artifact that is a historically contingent mechanism of the apparatus of disability and other apparatuses with which disability is entwined. The idea of an industrial complex has a distinctly American lineage with multilateral implications. In 1961, during a televised speech broadcast into the living rooms of a predominantly white middle-class America, President Dwight D. Eisenhower introduced the idea of an industrial complex by invoking the term military industrial complex. Eisenhower's use of the term military industrial complex 
was intended to warn this sector of the American public about, and I quote, the unprecedented conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry, end quote. Eisenhower was especially concerned about the potential of the arms industry to influence government policies and budgets. It is concerned about the potential of American arms manufacturers and manufacturers of other military related items to coerce the US government to finance military aggressions abroad that would serve their own economic interests. In other words, Eisenhower coined the term military industrial complex to articulate this concern. But the more money that could potentially be made at home from military aggressions abroad, the more that military aggressions abroad would be made. And the more money at home and wars abroad that were made, the more influence that American manufacturers of military related items could wield over elected US government officials in the states in which the items would be produced. After Eisenhower, Angela Davis introduced the term prison industrial complex to describe the system through which prisons have become a mechanism of racial segregation in the United States and a primary source of profits for many American manufacturers and multilateral corporations. Likewise, I use the term nursing home industrial complex refer to an expansive socioeconomic network that comprises nursing homes and other so-called care facilities, medical clothing and linen suppliers, healthcare and administrative temp agencies, professional associations and trade unions, prepared food companies, medical equipment manufacturers, pharmaceutical corporations, and other entities that benefit financially from the segregation of senior and disabled populations, nursing homes and other congregate settings, and the ableism with which this exclusion is co-constitutive. Indeed, the nursing home industrial complex has increasingly come to hold coercive economic influence over elected officials about which Eisenhower had forewarned. Note, for example, that the term nursing home industrial complex aptly describes the relationship between the American nursing home industry and US politicians, as was starkly evident when early in the summer of election year 2020, US Senator Mitch McConnell initiated legislation that would grant legal immunity to the owners of American nursing homes for liability related to COVID-19 deaths and any other fatalities that occur on their premises. By early July, in fact, 22 American states had already adopted such immunity laws, beginning with the state of New York, thanks to a clause in Governor Andrew Cuomo's annual budget. As a mechanism of the apparatus of disability and ultimately neoliberalism, however, the nursing home industrial complex traverses across the borders of the United States, extending far beyond them, with the nursing home industry now an integral part of the economies of Australia, Canada, France, Hong Kong, Italy, South Africa, South Korea, Sweden, and the United Kingdom, while seeking new markets in Latin America, Caribbean, India, and elsewhere. Since early March of this year, discourses about COVID-19 cases and deaths in North American nursing homes and other institutions in which elders and disabled people are segregated have unraveled in the North American mainstream press on social media. In the terms of these discourses, COVID-19 cases and deaths in these institutions have been largely naturalized and medicalized, represented as an inevitable consequence of a vulnerability 
inherent to the residents of the institutions due to their age or an apparently intrinsic characteristic now commonly identified as an underlying condition or in more technical terms, comorbidity. Only sporadically has the succession of COVID-19 outbreaks in North American nursing homes been attributed to the very nature and functioning of the institutions themselves, including their architectural design, scarcity of supplies and resources that beleaguers them, isolation and disciplinary regimes that characterize them, and the transient nature of the labor that sustains them. All of which elements constitute the economic bottom line of the nursing home industrial complex, and the individualizing and totalizing power that conditions it. In late April of 2020, more than 1,000 of the 1,350 COVID-19 deaths had by that time occurred in the Canadian province of Quebec were tied to nursing homes. In May, the Progressive Conservative Government of the province of Ontario issued a call to the Canadian Armed Forces to assist with the emergency in Ontario nursing homes following the lead of the government of Quebec, which had already done so a month earlier. For by May, the situation in Ontario nursing homes had likewise spun out of control. With the rising number of COVID-19 cases and deaths amongst residents and staff, most of the latter of whom were racialized and newcomer women. By June, more than 80%, that is more than 6,000 of the total number of COVID-19 deaths in Canada by that time, had occurred in nursing homes. At the end of September, COVID-19 deaths in Canadian nursing homes accounted for in excess of 82% of the close to 9,500 COVID-19 deaths in Canada by that time, with almost 2,000 of these deaths occurring in nursing homes throughout Ontario. On October 9th of this year, more than 60 nursing homes in Ontario were in lockdown due to COVID-19 outbreaks. By mid-October, in the Canadian capital city of Ottawa, Ontario, 30 nursing homes were in the grip of outbreaks, leading to the deployment in these institutions of more than 600 Red Cross workers. By October 20th, there were outbreaks in 87 nursing homes in Ontario. By November 14th, that number had climbed to 100, with 26 nursing home outbreaks in Ontario's capital city of Toronto and surrounding areas alone. By December 4th, the number of outbreaks in Ontario nursing homes had reached 117. Indeed, by October 24th, almost a fifth of the COVID-19 deaths in Canada had occurred in Ontario nursing homes. Despite these ghastly figures, however, Ontario's neoliberal progressive conservative premier, Doug Ford, has consistently refused to launch a comprehensive and transparent public inquiry into the circumstances surrounding these COVID-19 cases and deaths. On November 16th, in fact, Ford's provincial government voted unanimously in favor of Bill 218 legislation similar to McConnell's that now ensures retroactive legal immunity in nursing homes against lawsuits brought forward due to COVID-19 deaths that occur on their premises. By no coincidence, Michael Harris, the current chair of the board of directors of Chartwell, the largest owner and operator of for-profit nursing homes in Canada, is a close advisor to Premier Ford and is himself a former progressive conservative premier of Ontario. Harris's annual salary of 230,000 Canadian dollars for his part-time position as chair of the board of Chartwell, his holdings in Chartwell of an estimated four and a half to seven million dollars Canadian, and Chartwell's relationships provincial governments across Canada, 
are in combination integral elements of the nursing home industrial complex in Canada. When Harris served as Ontario's premier from 1995 to 2002, his neoliberal government like Ford's slashed public spending on health care and other social services, relaxed regulations and public oversight of nursing homes, removed nursing home staff minimums, and significantly expanded privatization of these institutions by redirecting public provincial public funding. I've lost my redirecting provincial public funding privately owned for-profit nursing home corporations. The majority of COVID-19 deaths in Ontario have indeed occurred in for-profit nursing homes, resulting in public outcry and demands for the Canadian federal government to, quote, take control of long-term care, end quote. Despite the fact that funding and oversight of nursing homes in Canada falls under the jurisdiction of the provincial governments, not the federal government. This public outcry and these demands became more insistent nevertheless, after military medical personnel deployed in more than a dozen Ontario nursing homes without breaks, released a whistleblower report about health and safety violations in five of the facilities, four of which are for-profit nursing homes. These violations included cockroach and rodent infestations, verbal abuse of residents, dirty linen or no linen on residents' beds, inadequate cleaning and sanitizing of their rooms, fecal contamination, lack of PPE, lack of hygiene, understaffing, and lack of staff training with respect to infection control. Let me underscore that these sorts of infractions are not unique to the unprecedented circumstances of the pandemic, as Ford and others in his government have both insisted and denied. On October 22nd, in fact, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's news program Marketplace aired a segment in which it reported that 85% of the more than 600 nursing homes in Ontario have over the past five years repeatedly broken laws with incidents of abuse and neglect of residents, failing to provide residents with enough food and water, and medical errors such as distribution of the wrong medication. As David Common, the host of the Marketplace segment, pointed out furthermore, an astonishing 30,000 such infractions have during the past five years occurred in these institutions with no repercussions for any of them. Some advocates for elders and disabled people argue that public ownership of nursing homes and so-called long-term care facilities would resolve the widespread problems that prevail in these institutions. Note, however, that only about 60% of these institutions in Ontario operate on a for-profit basis, although, as I've noted, 85% of Ontario nursing homes have been repeatedly cited for abuse, neglect, and medical error. I want to emphasize, therefore, that the problems that persist in nursing homes and other institutions where seniors, elders, and younger disabled people are segregated, constitute irreducible aspects of the institutions themselves and indeed are functional to them. The outbreaks that continue to occur in nursing homes and similar congregate settings across Canada and indeed globally, are also not due to an inherent characteristic of seniors and disabled people. That is not due to some inherent vulnerability of the senior and disabled populations who live in these institutions, public ownership, better funding and adequate staffing would manage and control. On the contrary, 
thousands of COVID-19 cases and deaths in nursing homes and other so-called long-term care institutions across the world. Like the thousands of COVID-19 cases and deaths in prisons, our testament to the insidious nature of both the institutions themselves and the carceral archipelago of our societies in which they increasingly contribute. In short, COVID-19 has thrown into relief that nursing homes, like prisons, must be abolished. That is, both the nursing home industrial complex and the prison industrial complex must be dismantled. Many feminist philosophers, rather than embark on a path of sustained critical examination of the concept of vulnerability, have worked to redeem the allegedly prediscursive status that has customarily been ascribed to vulnerability and simultaneously disparaged. However, the apparent self-evidence of the ontological status of vulnerability is an artifact of structural gaslighting. Hence, the concept of vulnerability too should be the target of a feminist project of conceptual engineering. Rather than a prediscursive inherent human trait, vulnerability is a contextually specific social phenomenon whose politically potent and artifactual character could be recognized and acknowledged by feminist philosophers, among others were to take up Foucault's idea of eventalization. Foucault used the term eventalization to refer to a breach of self-evidence that exposes the singularity of a given practice or state of affairs. Eventalization aims to show that things are not as necessary as they seem. As Foucault remarked, and I quote, it wasn't as a matter of course that mad people came to be regarded as mentally ill. It wasn't self-evident that the only thing to be done with the criminal was to lock him up. And it wasn't self-evident that the only cause that, and it wasn't self-evident that the causes of illness were to be sought through the individual examination of bodies, end quote. No one is a criminal many people are criminalized. No one has a race or a disability. People are racialized and disabled. No one is a vulnerable, to use Eva Kate's term. Many people, including seniors, disabled people, and prisoners, are made vulnerable, that is, are vulnerabilized. Even while kept adequately staffed nursing homes and long-term care facilities, cannot be the proper response to the question of how societies should provide to elders and younger disabled people. On the contrary, such apparently genteel institutions should rather be recognized as the window dressing of the nursing home industrial complex, which is a carceral network of power that contributes to the reproduction of ableism, ageism, and racism while underwriting a neoliberal political and social environment in which productivity and profit are steadily prioritized. A comment that African-American feminist legal scholar Dorothy Roberts recently made about the futility of care ethics for work on prisons and so-called child welfare systems also captures the futility of a care ethics approach to nursing homes and other institutions in which seniors, elders, and younger disabled people are incarcerated. As Roberts put it, and I quote, you can't fix prisons or so-called foster care by training their agents to be more caring. The very logic and design of these systems are antithetical to care, end quote. I want to argue likewise that the eugenic logic of neoliberalism, which provides the impetus for the nursing home industrial complex, makes a mockery of care and concern. To quote Roberts again, and I do, the only way is abolition, end quote. 
In short, my argument is that we should regard upscaled regulation and renovation of nursing homes and other institutions in which seniors and younger disabled people are confined as a kind of gentrification of apparatuses of power. Gentrification designed in part to ease the minds of the community at large about the segregation and dehumanization of these institutions, sorry, the, of the community at large about the segregation and dehumanization that these institutions facilitate. In other words, gentrification effectively expands the scope of the apparatuses of power and the systemic injustices that they constitute and comprise. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Shelley, for that very powerful and poignant presentation. I'm going to abuse my privileges, Chair, very quickly here. Just to you mentioned the point about us not we shouldn't naturalize the idea of COVID deaths in care homes, and I have a quotation that illustrates that as well as anything I could imagine. This was a letter to the Journal of the American Medical Directors Association. We interviewed one long-term care facility located in southern Ile-de-France that had registered more than 24 deaths related to COVID-19 among 140 residents. No acute respiratory distress syndrome was observed and mortality was mostly due to hypovolemic shock, that is dying of thirst. Most of the victims had been left alone in their rooms for confinement settings for many days without help because of the lack of protective masks and the work overload for caregivers affected 40% staff absenteeism rate, et cetera. So to my mind, that, that illustrates the idea of, of COVID deaths in care homes not being uh, natural as well as anything I could imagine. Okay, sorry for abusing my privilege there. We have a couple of questions. Oh, no, you wanna... Erica, I, Eric, I just want to say that, you know, um, you know that, that's a very pertinent quote. And, and I, I mean, the, if, you, if you research, do any amount of research on, in this area, um, COVID-19 and nursing homes, you get story after story uh, like that. And, and still, uh, as, I've, as I tried to um, point out in, in, in my presentation, and still you get this, I, you know, you get these claims about the vulnerability of the seniors. It's, it's not, you know, it's not the institutions themselves and, and you know, the um, institutional culture and operations, but, you know, it, it's something inherent to the, the people themselves. Okay, great. Um, we've got some questions already. So uh, Harry Hudson asks, you mentioned comorbidities earlier. I wonder if you could address the term frailty. How does labeling the elderly and some disabled more people generally as frail affect our attitudes? Indeed, as someone who works in the English uh, National Health Service, I've noted that the attitude towards frail patients was to get those patients out into care homes fast, initially without COVID testing to supposedly reduce their risk. Of course, this was a disaster. Um, so I-, I so, so the question is, how does, the, how does the, the concept of frailty feed into this, I guess? I think that, I think that it's closely, um, you know, associated with, with, with the concept of vulnerability. Um, the, you know, the, the term vulnerability has, has been the one that's been circulated, circulating in the discourse around nursing homes and COVID-19 rather than the term frailty. I mean, the, um, but you know, they, they really serve the same, same kinds of purposes, right? Um, to, to promote this idea. Um, and, and, you know, um, going back to a number of the things that Christine overall said about ageism and, and ideas about um, seniors and age and, um, so that's what I would say with respect to the term frailty. It's it's um, it's in the discourse around COVID nineteen and nursing homes. It's being supplanted by the term vulnerability, um, but it, it it's, it's doing the same work. Great. Um, so Zara Bain asks, uh, thanks so much for the Shelley. A small question: How does the narrative around quote unquote excess deaths? relating to COVID connect with your arguments about naturalization of COVID deaths? Um, excess, the, the narrative around excess deaths. Um, yeah, has, so people, people often, uh, I take it the question is about people often want to compare the number of, uh, you know, confirmed COVID deaths to in the US, for example, what the CDC reports as the number of excess deaths. So. 
uh, you know, we're, we're told that there are sort of 260,000 more deaths this year than is normal, and those are called excess deaths. So the question is about that term and how you think it relates to the idea of naturalization of COVID deaths. Um, naturalization of COVID deaths, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to undermine the idea that there is a natural COVID death uh, in, in the discourses that have been presented to us thus far around nursing homes and um, COVID-19. Um, I think that uh, disabled people, seniors, elders uh, have been seen as disposable and um, seen as uh, you know, not really not really the deaths that, that count. Their deaths don't count um, as much um, as other deaths. And um, um, you know, they're seen as they're seen as you know they're seen as inevitable as as more natural. Um, and I I I I've tried to um, I've tried to indicate why that's not the case. Thanks. Um, the next question is uh, from Supri sorry, Supriya uh, Akerkar. Uh, and the question is, how do, do we know how the etymology of the phrase care home has come about? Uh, your presentation has shown that they are uncare and not homes, but you, as you say, industrial complexes. Uh, care home, that seems to be a bit of a paradox. So what's the etymology of the term, do you know? Um, the, uh, I don't, um... I have read um, some things about the etymology of, of nursing homes, of care homes. I think the term care homes uh, is more a um, is more a, a recent is a recent um, euphemistic term that's being introduced um, uh, because um, nursing homes, the term nursing home is supposed to be so um, so outdated, but in fact, um, it, it's it's more appropriate, I think, for really the the, um, the uh, conditions in these places. And I, I have to say that um, you know, before before the pandemic, I, I think that many, I I think that majority of the population really did not know what nursing homes are, are all about and what the conditions are actually like in them. Um, as I said, um, people uh, have you know, tended to think of them as um, you know, sites of care and love and benevolence and, and it's just not the, it's not the way they operate. Um, uh, quite the contrary, uh, you know, it's like even down to things like um, you know how how a certain resident can't use more than one brief, like well, what's called an adult diaper in a day. You know, um, so because it doesn't fit in the lines of the budget. So um, the the um, I don't know the exact etymology, but um, I would say that um, I, I would say that uh, of the term care home. I would say that um, my best guess is that care home has been introduced as a euphemism uh, and quite possibly, um, you know, uh, influenced by, uh, even influenced by the, the, the rise um, and expansion of, uh, of the whole idea of care ethics. Um, so, uh, so, um, yeah, I would assume it's partly a euphemism and a partly an attempt to make it seem demedicalized to the people who nursing right. home sounds medicalized in a way that care home doesn't sound. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I see anything else in the queue right now. Does anybody else have a question they want to post in the chat? Yeah, so uh, MP uh, has a question. Go ahead. Eric, I think there's some in the Q&A, uh, if I'm 
Am I in the am I in the wrong chat? Uh, so, so I think this, the system seems to be breaking down slightly. Uh, okay, here um, we so, go. So if you look at the Q and A, there's one from Cynthia Spark, one from Nancy Hirschman. Do you, do you see that? In the chat, am I? Am, oh, Q, oh, I'm sorry. I, so I in the Q &A. got it. Okay, here yeah, we go. No, I did not even know. Okay, sorry. No. Uh, a terrific. Uh, this is from Julie Maybe. Thanks so much, Shelley. A terrific presentation, which so clicks close to home, as it were. My own mother is currently living in a quote retirement home in Guelph, Ontario. Do you think a version of care ethics could also be used to argue for the conclusion that nursing homes and other such institutions should be abolished? Something like really caring for people requires not having such institutions. Um, well, I guess my, uh, um, my short answer would be sure um, that that would be possible. I mean, I, I um, I wouldn't want to endorse a care ethics for, for other reasons, um, but uh, I think I think it's possible that um, you know one one might be able to devise a care ethics approach that uh, um, called for the abolishment or the abolition of of, um, of these places. Sure. Uh, great. Okay, so Tammy Niden, if I have that right, says, thank you for your talk. Can you speak to the difference between the need for care and need for congregate settings? What fuels the nursing home industrial complex's lack uh, of community services and access to such services for a full continuum of care needs? I fear in advocacy discourse, I have often seen need for care and need for congregate care conflated. Um, right. Um Certainly, um, those those two are often um, conflated, um, and and um, the I mean I'm I'm calling for abolition of, of these institutions, and so I'm calling for um, the um, you know better funding and expansion of home home care um, and home and and services in the community um, for people. Um, and I know that um, uh, my colleague Joseph Stramondo is going to talk uh, a lot about community care um, and social services, home care, in his talk um, tomorrow. Um, so I don't want to say too much about that. Um, but you write that what one thing that fuels um, the nursing home industrial complex is lack of community service, but I, but there, you know, why, you know, there are reasons why there's a lack of community services, and so it's it goes deeper than just the fact that there's a lack of, of services. It, it goes to, you know, neoliberalism and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, institutionalization and um, economic bottom line. Um, and uh, and and ableism, uh, you know, certainly um, because uh, you know you you put people in institutions if you don't see them as um, you know human beings with a range of emotions and needs and and uh, and value, um, and so so it's um, it, it it it's. There's a reason there's a lack of community services and and why there are institutions instead. Sure, and one of the one of the most powerful ways in which the nursing home industrial complex operates is they lobby to make sure that Medicaid or Medicaid and Medicare funds are not available for use for home care and community care. Um, great. So I have a question from Cynthia Stark. Uh, some people opposed. Uh, the so-called lockdowns and other restrictions on the grounds that we should have life as usual while, quote, protecting the vulnerable. That was a, a phrase I think that came from the Boris Johnson administration early on. It's obvious that this cannot be done as vulnerable people need to work, parent, etc. My thought was that those who endorsed this idea must be imagining that virtually all the vulnerable were in, quote, care institutions. More cynically, one might infer that advocates of this idea believe that all the vulnerable should be institutionalized. Thoughts? Um, I'm not quite sure what I should grab from that. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, again, I, I don't think that 
I, I don't want to endorse this idea of, you know, uh, of the vulnerable who have to be protect, protected. I think that people are made vulnerable. Um, and um, I think this is done through a variety of mechanisms, social mechanisms and processes. And so it gets, gets the, it's the um, direction of causation wrong to think that we have to protect the vulnerable um, because in fact, they're being made vulnerable. Um, they're being vulnerabilized by even the very idea that they need to be protected. Um, and um, Certainly they were made vulnerable by being put in care homes. There's no question about that. Care homes made people extremely vulnerable to COVID. Right, yeah. right. Um, Nancy Hirschman, uh, this might have to be the last question, I'm not sure. Uh, I appreciate your reference to feminist care theory. Uh, do you think that its weaknesses can be addressed to be useful for your argument? For, ex for instance, Joan Tronto would agree, sorry, would agree with your critique of how care is currently administered or not administered, but I'm always suspicious of care theory precisely because it tends to be so gendered. If you don't institutionalize care, women do the bulk of it in the home. What kind of alternative model of care provision would get beyond this duality? Um, well, I don't. Um, I think that um, I always, I, I always recoil a bit when I, when I, um, when I um, hear arguments about how women do most of the care in the home in the same, in, in, you know, in the same um, paragraph or argument um, uh, as discussions of, uh, you know, deinstitutionalization. Um, because, um, well, for a number of reasons. Um, what kind of art alternative care model of care? Well, I think that, um, I think that there can be care in the home um, if, that doesn't, you know, doesn't, you know, depend upon women doing, um, doing, you know, more or even most of that. Um, if there are sufficient services, I mean, uh, you know, um, disabled activists and, you know, increasingly disabled theorists are talking about how, especially with the pandemic, are talking about how home care, um, you know, care in the community. Uh, you know, it is, it is um, significantly less, you know, expensive than, you know, you know, you know, carrying the institution, the run, the running of institutions. So I think that it's possible to have care in the community that doesn't rely upon, you know, that doesn't need to, um, that doesn't presuppose uh, um, uh, a reliance upon gendered work um, and, you um, uh, can be can be adequate can can enable people to flourish can enable people to you know um, live lives um, that um, you know that don't require them to be isolated and segregated. Thanks. I, I think we probably need to wrap it up. If someone else is that Jonathan, are we time to? Yeah, I, I think we we better okay. um, keep sign there. Thank you. Um, what, Eric, did you just want to wind up? Um, yeah, so uh, I thought that was all terrific. Uh, thanks for that, Shelley. Very powerful stuff. And thanks um, very much, Eric. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, and I'll well, just turn it over to you, uh, Joe. Thanks so much. Well, well, thank you, Eric, and particularly Shelley. Um, fantastic paper, and also uh, for those who weren't at the start, this conference is all Shelley's doing. She's put the whole program together and she's done all the work. Um, so let's uh, uh, applause now. And um, I want to thank everyone who's still with us and Christine's joining the, the applause. Um, so we're back on tomorrow. I, I won't attempt to say what time we are in every time zone because I know there are people from all around the world here. Um, but look at the link. It, it's just it, it's one o'clock UK time, one o'clock in the afternoon UK time. So it could be anything anywhere else in the world. But we welcome back as many of you as possible tomorrow and on Friday too. And just remains for me to 
to thank all the speakers and chairs today and to tell the speakers and chairs to look in their email inbox because there's a link for uh, another short meeting if people would like to come to that not there's no requirement to come but just just a little uh, wrap up and to thank everyone and uh, the support from Katie and Jamie who've been behind the scenes today and the captioner who will now have to caption my thanks to the captioner whoever you are or probably plural so um, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and we'll begin tomorrow with what we call an informal meet and greet which is really just for you to put a little bit about yourself in the chat when we arrive that that's what we will be asking so i think we will close now and thanks everyone see you tomorrow thank you shelley so see you as many as possible tomorrow goodbye <laughs>